because I knew you know, I had six months to the Olympic Games right. and I knew it was going to take a lot to get from literally in a wheelchair to then being at the Olympic Games. She kind of created this natural um, perfectionist in that I wanted to be great at mm. everything. You know, if you're going to do a job, do it properly. So what does it take to become an Olympian? I'm a true believer that anyone can achieve what they want to achieve, mm. but not everyone is willing to do it. What would you say to someone who thinks that, oh, you have to be lucky to find opportunities? Exactly. People do not build resilience without adversity. There's no such thing. Resilience comes from yeah. overcoming a barrier or a struggle and right. coming bouncing back faster and better than ever. So if you don't have anything that's blocking your way, you cannot build resilience. So, uh, Montel, we were speaking the other day and uh, obviously you told me a bit more about your story, your life and your wins and successes. But, but where I really want to start is I just want to understand what's your origin story and did that influence um, your successes, your wins in Olympics and so on. So tell us a bit more about yourself and your origin story. Yeah, um, certainly. Well, I guess my origin story <laughs> for me starts, um, it actually al almost reverts back to away from sport. It's always been a part of my, my life, hugely. Yeah. But I, I realised as I got older as well, and became the athlete that I did become. Um, a lot of it was actually determined by my upbringing and my life and how we navigated life as a family and things like that. So yeah. um, I was I was raised, born and raised in South London my whole life. Um, it was mm -hmm. a very small primary school, literally yeah. one class per entry. Um, my mum used to come in actually um, and teach our first netball team there. Oh, wow. That was my kind of experience of sport. We we lost very badly. Actually, my first ever comp was seventeen nil. Yeah, didn't know that was possible in netball. Um, and my experiences there, I guess, because everything was really close to it. Family was really close. Um, I was on my own for seven years. My younger brother didn't come for seven years, mm -hmm. so I felt like I was only child for a bit of time because right. the gap became bigger. And then when I was by someone fourteen, he's only seven. Yeah. So for a long time, it meant that had a lot of, um, I guess, attention on me. My mum used to read to me every day. Mm. Um, my parents were very, very young and they really taught me how to work hard. That was always the, the key thing. And it is has been up the whole right. way through life. I've kind of created a perfectionist by by nature. Yeah. Um, just because my environment was very much like, my mum would say, you know, if you're going to do a job, do it properly. Right. Um, she always said that. And I, yeah. at the time I was, like hoovering my room so i think she just said it because she wanted me to do a good yeah. job but she literally I mean, we just come back yeah. from holiday and she said the exact same thing to me on holiday yeah. so you know what i say if you're gonna do it something do it a hundred percent so right. she kind of created this natural um perfectionist in that i wanted to be great at mm. everything now we're talking about mundane tasks mm. whether it was just me reading or applying myself to something and yeah. um, whether it was actually just being a, a, a good friend I always wanted to be the best version of myself, yeah. um, which also allowed me to not look outwardly. Mm. I learned very er early not to learn, look outwardly because we didn't really have much. So I didn't yeah. really look at the, my environment as like, I want this, want this. I just thought, well, we'll just be grateful for the stuff that we had. Right. Um, we didn't go on holiday. We, we didn't go anywhere. I really wanted to see the world because yeah. I didn't leave South London. You know, the pressure, time. the pressure that you talk about from mm -hmm. parents. Uh, and I mean, I experienced a similar thing and I feel like it's a, it's a thing about people of color uh, yeah. because we move from wherever we move from, you know, our parents did and they really worked hard to move up. And then obviously you have kids and then you want them to succeed. Right. So you put pressure by default because they probably saw a lot more than we did. Right. Yeah, so do sure. you think, you know, like pressure on young people in terms of, you know, work hard so you succeed? Is that how do you balance between too much pressure and enough pressure? That's a great um, question because I felt like I had, I guess, say I never had any pressure, mm. which is weird because when I look back on it, it was very much like be resilient, be determined, be right. driven, but without the pressure of saying you, you're not allowed to fail. Mm. And I think the, the failure part of it is, is a big part of it yeah. because many young people and ourselves don't attempt things not because most of the time of the fear of, of yeah. do it doing well even yeah. it's okay how badly can this go and what am I going to look yeah. look like so the pressure of you being able to go and fulfill a dream or to express yourself in any way that you want to do I think it is really challenging and, f and for me I didn't really feel that extreme pressure because 
my world they mm. weren't doing a lot of things it wasn't like everyone was super high achievers and i was right. trying to uh, like attain that and um, whereas now everyone's always trying to be better and better than anyone everyone else right. or looking or even maybe even your family mm. but for me for example you know being the first person in my family lineage to mm. go to university right that then you then become kind of like the change maker the within the yeah, family. Yeah. yeah, benchmark. And and that came from not those that had done, even if it's lesser or or or, or, sm or smaller feet, mm. it was the fact that, that all of that, that grind actually drove me towards yeah. those passions. I think one, one thing that you made a point about, you know, the pressure was not, not pressure for me. And it, it actually makes me think that everybody handles pressure very differently. Mm. So what might be okay for you might be too much for me. Or, or not, yeah. right? I could handle more, right? So I think it's uh, pressure is very much, I guess, in a way, subjective on yeah. how much you can deal with it, right? And think, I mean, talking about pressure, obviously you're Olympian and you won so many medals, both the winter and some summer Olympics. What does it take to become an Olympian? Like, t tell us about your journey Gosh, good, good. and the first time you got on the track uh, in the Olympics. What was the experience? So this is a, a question that I get asked all the time. And I know a lot of people get asked things like this, even in business and, mm. and industries, because it, it's the same thing. Success in itself, like you said, is also subjective. And for those who, for example, what does it take to become an Olympian? Mm. Arguably, you can, you can imagine without the obvious things of hard work, determination, grit, yeah. you need to have a good environment and space. You need to have a good sport yeah. network. Those things are kind of the ingredients of it. But just like, you know, making a cake, I could give you the ingredients to make right. a cake right now. And we would make very different cakes if yeah, you didn't have the yeah. same recipe. It's a practice, right? Right. It would yeah. be completely different. So knowing how to fit all those elements together is the key to, to achieving it. But you also yeah. need to be adaptable and be flexible yeah. because it's not smooth. You're not going to win all the time. No. It's not going to be it's not going to be easy. You might change through transition. My, my Olympic Games for summer and winter were 14 years apart. So wow. it's a very long and very different environment. Mm. However, I was able to make, you know, the, the highest echelons, I guess, of sport yeah. in very different, two different lifetimes. This is, you know, the technology age back in 2008 when I went to the Summer Games. Right. Facebook just came out and it was literally, social media just crept just in. Just started, yeah. yeah. Whereas now it's just like, there's so Everywhere. many different platforms and, and different. So the, the environment, everything is completely different to, to get there. Mm. But essentially it's like making any decisions and making mm. any, achieving any goals. It's about looking at where you want to get to right. and then working backwards and just kind of reverse engineering that and saying, well, how yeah. do I get closer to being the person mm. that I'm saying that I want to, to get that person that I want to be? Yeah. You know, when you mentioned 2008 uh, and you must be in like your early mid 20s, right? And if, if I think about the young people today and what they experience, you know, you talk about social media, right? Mm. And there's a... You know, oh, I'm going to get viral, overnight success, basically, is what I'm trying to get to. Uh, but, you know, going back to how do you become an Olympian, mm -hmm. it's not about overnight success. No. So uh, let's unpack a little bit more. Obviously, you know, the obvious things like hard work and grit and, you know, yeah. resilience. Is there is there like a wow factor that you need or can anybody become successful when it comes to Olympics? Uh, obviously, you have to put in the work, the practice yeah. and all of that. Is that the key, really? I, yeah, I'm a true believer that anyone can achieve what they want to achieve, mm. but not everyone is willing to do it. And I think that's mm. the difference. You can walk in, there's so many people that have come before that I coach as well now, and athletes will say they want to do this, they want to run X, Y, Z. Mm. So I will tell you what it's going to take. And then mm. you have to make that decision on yourself, whether that's something that you're willing mm. and able to uh, try, and, try and achieve. Yeah. Because the gap is what we're trying to fill here. It's not whether you actually could be. Yeah, you could, but do you need right. to start with talent? Of course you need to start with sure. talented. Yeah. Can't, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I couldn't make the Olympics, for example, as a marathon runner, mm -hmm. because I just literally run fast in a straight line. Sprint, that yeah. was my, my talent. So mm -hmm. for me to be able to go in 26 two point miles, I'm not going to be able to do yeah. it, achieve that. It's going to be a little bit unrealistic for me, yeah. but could I do something else? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. apart from all of those things, I think that you can do, but there is always going to be a wow factor, but I don't think that the wow factor is not... Un like unteachable or you couldn't learn it but I think some people definitely have it na more people, natural than others and yeah, it's just like yeah. you're saying with our, with our um, upbringings and our environments some people are taught about 
for example, managing finances or building businesses. Right. I was never taught that stuff. Yeah. Some people are literally fed that from when they're yeah. two, three years old, maybe in a household, yeah. because their families are entrepreneurs or they have businesses. Yeah. I wasn't. So of course, that child there, me, in yeah. the environment in South London, doesn't have to, haven't, hasn't had the exposure or yeah. skill set put upon them for them to grow mm. into that person, right. which someone else might do. Yeah. So for me, it would be harder for me to start a business and all those things, but not for someone else. Someone else. And it's a similar right. thing with yeah. the sport. I started off in a very... Um, great environment that was full fueled by sport. My dad mm. was my first football coach. Mm. My mum was my first netball coach. Imagine right. just at yeah. a really grassroots level. Yeah. But that exposure to sport, then obviously then it created from yeah. five years, six years old to like 15 years later to right. being an Olympian and one of like the fastest you know, British females yeah. in British history in the in 100 metres. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Just uh, kind of thinking a lot more about uh, this, you know, <clears throat> you talk about specific skills or specific talent, right? Uh, you started in sprinting, right? And then you moved yeah. to bobsleigh and then you also won there as well. I mean, you could say there's a bit of a natural transition there because, you know, you're running. I mean, it's not as simple. Please <laughs> excuse me. I, I, maybe simplifying this. Uh, but, you know, in bobsleigh, you run and then you sort of, you know, jump on the thing. What, what is that thing called, by the way? Bob's, it's called a bobsleigh. It's literally called yeah, bobsleigh. Okay. bobsleigh. Okay. So I thought there was yeah. a technical term. Okay, yeah. good. Um, but that there is a change, right? It's going from one sport to another sport. Was that a hard decision? And how do you decide about, you know, changing lanes? Yeah. Without, yeah, no pun like, intended. Incredibly, it wasn't a hard decision because once I'd made it, I then, like, readjusted my mm. mindset and said, okay, what is this going to look like? What is this going to be? Because yeah. when I first tried out Bob Stain, did it, and I loved it my first year, within a few months that I was on, on ice, I then still competed in the summer in mm. athletics got an awful injury, had surgery on my hamstring. Oh, no. Um, and it was, it was a really, I guess, a career-breaking injury in the sense that I remember sitting in the car, like, eyeballs, just, like, oh, no. balling my eyeballs out, saying to myself, I don't know if I can do this. Not that I can't right. do it, but I don't know if I am actually capable, Physically, mentally and strong, right. to, to cope with what it's going to take to get back. Because I knew, you know, I had six months to the Olympic Games, right. and I knew it was going to take a lot to get from literally in a wheelchair lying wow. on a hospital bed to then being at the Olympic Games. And I just knew what it was going to take in my head. So I thought, oh gosh, can I even do it? But once I made the decision to do that, then everything mm -hmm. then falls into place because you then say, look, you might not get there, that's yeah. fine, but I'm going to try. And the same thing happened with Bob Slate. It was an opportunity that presented itself to me. Right. And I thought, let me try, because one of the things that I found really difficult in the past was making decisions. Right. And I actually literally went online, no joke, went on Google and I wrote, how do you make a decision? I literally looked it up once. Yeah. I saw all this like great information about, you know, um, think about what you obviously want to do, weighing up the different pros and cons, maybe writing lists yeah. was in there and that yeah. didn't really help because I could easily make loads of pros and then put loads of cons yeah. in. But one of the things that was really valuable to me was being able to change my mind right. and knowing that some most decisions are not permanent and yeah. that I could also do it. I could say yes, yeah. but I could say no later. Right. And it took so much pressure off me to say, oh my gosh, I can actually This is not just, forever. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have to get stuck in this. And because that, that fear of being trapped yeah. is more overpowering than not even getting it done mm. in the first place. So once yeah. I made a decision that I could also go back, I just thought, well then why not? And that just developed and developed. Yeah. And then I reset that goal to saying, I want to go and be an Olympic team yeah. and you know, I make British history. And that then became my new goal within Bob State. But it was very difficult being 31 years old, doing doing athletics individual sport for 15 years right. in the summer sport mm -hmm. with a with a strong infrastructure to go into a sport that is military led mm. um it's very mole dominated um it, it's got i guess there's very there's racial discrepancies in terms of the different kinds of people that actually exist within the world yep. there were so many challenges there yeah. um that so it wasn't easy in those aspects because you have to be a different human yep. and within yourself to kind to actually achieve still within yeah. that setting I'm going to touch on three things, what you just said. One is setbacks, second one is opportunities, and the third one is the racial discrimination and diversity, basically, in sports. Mm -hmm. uh, but before I do that, I, I think one thing what you, what you mentioned around you know, decision-making, actually, there's a whole episode on decision-making, and um, I have this framework that I, I, use, I try and use it for myself, but I also recommend people, is one, 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 one. So classify your decisions uh, according to the time you should spend on that decision. So either one minute, one day, one week, or one month. There are decisions that you know might take you months, but if you don't classify them, 
Like for example, you don't wake up in the morning and say, "I'm going to decide today whether I brush my teeth or not." You mm. just do it. Not even a minute, right? Like subconsciously, minus uh, one second it takes you, right? Yeah. So that actually helps you kind of speed up the decision making because right. what I've found is the opportunities that you miss is because sometimes you slow decision making, right? Yeah. So if you keep making a lot of decisions, because you can change later, right? You can go back and pivot again or change the direction, whatever. Anyway, just wanted to kind of mention that because that's amazing. Like, I it was am- amazing to hear sort of your decision making process, and then it, what you know I was sort of talking about in the other episode. And there's like a a Venn diagram, and this like right in the middle. So anyway, cool. so setbacks, so injury, uh, as you said, it could be career limiting. How do you overcome setbacks? What was your kind of strategy? Of course, you have to yeah. make your mind up. Uh, you have to work hard and so on, but. Yeah. Is there is there a, a recipe for it, or what are the things that you consider? Well, the first part of the recipe, like any recipe, you know, it says preheat the oven. So before you've even set the temperature, the oven has to get hot before you put it yes, in. There's yeah. a reason for that. I never do. I don't know right. why. See, some people don't, but the yeah. reason is because obviously it needs to get to a temperature so that you are then ready to start the process. Yeah. If you don't preheat the oven and you mm. put it in beforehand, that's heating up while you're cooking the thing it inside a lot at longer. the time. Yeah. And it changes the whole process. So yeah. it actually makes, it's a very key component, which is why it comes first. Yeah. And for me, the preheating of the process that I use in the recipe of the setbacks mm. is acknowledging that there will be setbacks. Right. Before you even get started in anything, managing your expectations, understanding yeah. that wherever it is that I'm trying to achieve and gets to, are there going to be times where I'm probably not going to be getting the results that I want? Right. Probably, absolutely. Yeah. You cannot go into um, elite level sport with an expectation of never being injured. Yeah. Which is extremely unrealistic. Right. But if you do go in there, it does make that one time, you know, you roll an ankle, harder. you pull, yeah. a, pull a hamstring, very mm. difficult because you never mm. imagine, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to be just on fire and I could train and train and train for six months on end. Yeah. That first race, you get an injury and you're like, whoa, yeah. wait, I was so ready. Right. And now you're back. If you go in with the mindset that I'm probably going to be injured at some point, or mm. I, this, what's going to happen when I get there? How do I manage those? To me, that's the first part of it. And I always go into things knowing that there are, it's not, it's not going to be perfect. Yeah. I'm coming from a, you know, yeah. a self-proclaimed perfection in the sense that I'd love things to go smoothly and knowing yeah. that, gosh, it annoys me when it doesn't, mm. but knowing that that's going to happen. The second part of that is just, uh, I always say it's the acronym WIN. Mm. So um, I think we spoke about this before in terms of, yeah. it's what, for me, it's what's important now. Yeah. So when I first did my first injury, and I pulled my hamstring and I was like walking and stuff. The next part of it, well, what's important now, right. it was to you know strap the leg up. It was to ice it, it was to elevate it, it was to go to the doctor. Take those stages mm. one by one and apply them because what you do right now is the most important thing you can do mm. for the future of this injury or this setback. Yeah. What decision you make today in this minute, in this hour, whether it could be just sleeping. You yeah. need to rest because sleep is really important for injuries and for yeah. example, recovery and, and regeneration. That needs to be a priority yeah. rather than me worrying about it. That's not a priority right now. So it's yeah. number two was definitely what's important now. What's important now? It is, it's eating, fueling this hamstring injury and stuff. Right. My mindset's already in the stage now where I was like, it's going to happen. Yeah. Then it's to say, okay, making a plan. Mm-hmm. How are we going to get back on track? Because yeah. it doesn't have to deter the journey completely where you're just not going to achieve it at all. Yeah. But it, you do then have to go, right, well, I tried to make, it's like when you, you go on, on maps and you look at a route, it gives you three alternative, three routes, yeah. right? One of them will be like three, four hours longer yeah. than the other route. You don't really take that one. No. The other one might be shorter, but faster, but there's a whole heap of traffic. Yeah. So you go, I'm going to sit in the traffic for a while, yeah. but knowing that you've got two alternative backups, yeah. it's key to going, I'm going to get there anyway. I'm going to still right. arrive at the destination. It might take me longer. Mm-hmm. I might end up like, taking a 20 extra miles on them 25 yeah. <laughs> and doing it. There's a bit of a positive uh, attitude to it, to it, right? So you de- you, yeah, yeah. You definitely have to have yeah, that. I mean, if you if you think that yes, there is going to be setbacks, but I'm going to be I'm going to be approaching this with a positive attitude. It, it, it more, almost gives you a bit more, I guess, faith to yeah. you know overcome those setbacks. Because if you already given up, right, and if you're not expecting setbacks and it happens, so it becomes a bit of a shock to the system, yeah. and it takes a longer time to recover from it, right? So, yeah, I, I think having a positive or some kind of optimism is also important. I feel. Yeah, you have yeah. to have, I always say, like, sometimes 1% faith. I would say my mouth has that. It's 1% faith. And what that is, is, you know, you can have you can have pessimism, you can have optimism, you can have realism, which might sit in the middle, some might argue. Right. 
But if you have that 1% faith that there's always a chance, yeah. then it allows you to then be able to free to mm. say, oh, I'm, okay, then we can, I can go for it. And I can still, like you said, overcome this right. because I know that there's still a chance that it will be yeah. positive and I'm ready for it. Yeah, yeah. I want to move on to the second bit, which is the opportunities. Uh, you mentioned that you got given the opportunity to you know, go for a bobsleigh. Yeah. Uh, likewise, you know, you might have given a lot more, a uh, lot many uh, opportunities. What would you say to someone who thinks that, oh, you have to be lucky to find opportunities? What, what does luck play in a role in, yeah. you know, these opportunities? Um, so for me, I always, I think, personally, I, I think that we, you hear it a lot, you create your own luck. And um, I do have friends that are, for me, are extremely lucky actually <laughs> saying that because they don't, sometimes they just don't do anything and the stuff just happens to them. Yeah. But I am... Um, but like, are they at the right place at the right time? Is it the, because... This is the thing. Thinking about, well, where, where, like you said, where are they? What are you doing? Mm. Who are you talking to? Who are you networking with? Um, are you putting your hand up for that 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 opportunity that came your, your way? Are you shying away yeah. from it? Um, but I also, are you seeking opportunities and not sitting back, waiting, going, oh, nothing right. ever comes to me? It's like the age old people saying, that. my mum says it all the time. My whole family does. They're like, well, when we win the, win the lottery, and I'm like, do you play the lottery? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, no. Well, then that's the first thing yeah. you have to do. I mean, yeah. even it's like preheating the, the oven, right? Right. Because yeah. <laughs> you're, just, you're just not going to ever win it if you don't even play it. Exactly. <laughs> it's pointless. I love so it. It's, but, it doesn't cross the mind. You just say things out there and think, oh, yeah. I'm going to be lucky enough to do it. But you have to then some t- create a little bit of your own luck. So yeah. You then have to go in there and buy a lottery ticket because that's the you creating yeah. the opportunity to be able to achieve that right. one-off chance that you might be able, able to yeah. do it. And the same thing with, like, like you said, with, with everything. It's creating, it's creating those opportunities, being aware, being around, yeah. talking to people. When you get the opportunity to share your experience in the story, for example, like um, in this podcast, mm. it's another opportunity for you to share your story yeah. that might touch somebody else. That's but also yeah. you get to express and give an insight to something that other people, one person might be listening and saying, I really, I really, that really, really helped me because mm. I didn't know that or I didn't realise yeah. that and have a realisation yeah. that they can do something themselves. Yeah, once. Do you know what? I, I keep on thinking about what you uh, said earlier and it's like stuck in my mind. I have to say, it's not relevant to what you just said. The win thing, the, what's important now, I think that's so profound. And I think I'm going to use it all the time now. Because <laughs> yeah. it's like you have to be present and think about how, what you have to solve today and then move on to you know tomorrow and the day after, right? Because right. you yeah. keep a lot of the times people worry about the future yeah. but then actually you can't even walk today if you you know if you want to race right. so you have to learn to walk first and then crawl what comes first no crawl walk and run and right run. Yeah. so yeah anyway so I just I wanted to mention that because it just got <laughs> stuck in my head uh, uh, and then yeah l- l- uh, third one is um, I know you talk about like racial um, differences and diversity uh, and I know you had an experience on that front too can you talk to us about um, what was your experience going into, you know, Bobsleigh, for example? Yeah. So going into... I, and sorry, uh, may I add, yeah. what do you think the world needs? Uh, do, obviously, we need more diversity, but what can we do to create more diversity in Bobsleigh, in, you know, any other industry that you see? Okay, so firstly, my first experience, I remember, really notably for myself, it was more like a realisation... I was in my first holding camp, um, training camp with the GB team, and I was literally on top of a mountain um, in Cestriere, wow. um, the Alps, and in this really tiny village, like a snow, no, it was quiet, dead quiet, snow everywhere. I stood there with my friend, um, another black athlete, and I said to him, and I, I literally looked at him and I said, dude, I was like, what are we doing here? <laughs> because, and he knew exactly what I meant when I said that. Yeah. I said, what are we doing here? Because yeah. this is insane. Like, mm-hmm. I don't see i don't see mountains i don't see snow i'm not in this environment mm. um it's not something that i'm accustomed to we're not accustomed to from where no, we in are south london from, no 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 in south <laughs> london definitely not from from jamaica where my family's from like it's it's like 30s 30 yeah. degrees plus and no sun no no snow for them um but it's just completely different world in terms of what not only what you see yeah. but how people operate mm. um going to Right, like loads of different countries, Eastern European countries, where yeah. there aren't many people of colour as well, having that experience. It, it was us driving, not people don't know this, but we, we travel a lot on our, on our own. So there'll be us three girls from the team driving a big truck, a Luton van, wow. with a bobstay in the back across the country lines, literally. You have to do that? Czech, Poland, yeah, yeah, oh, every wow. week, week in, week out. So every Saturday we'll have a race, Sunday we'll have a race, we'll pack the stuff up, takes about an hour, 
load the van up and we're going away. We've got like a 9, 10, 11, 12 journey, depending wow. on where we're going to go. I did so, not realise that. No, not many people do. So this is another <laughs> insight into Bob's Day World. You, you're going to be driving for 10, 11, 12 hours right. in the European country. Wrong, you know, other side of the road, in a maybe in a British van, because we bring brought it over mm. from the channel. Mm-hmm. And we're driving across and every single time I drove, we got stopped. Most of the time, I got stopped. By the police? It got to the point, yeah. By right. the, It got to the point where it was like, there's no point in me driving because we're going to get stopped. It's going to delay our time. Like, just yeah. put someone else in for the second. And I really like driving. Um, in general, everyone knows that I'm a driver. I like to yeah. drive. And plus, it helps with the journey because you're driving for, like, take it in turns, four, five, six, yeah. seven hours. So it, it helps me to more concentrate better if I'm driving. And, you know, I'll just get stopped yeah. by the police. Uh, you know, they'll ask and stuff. The moment they see the Bobstay van, they'll ask going away because they're right. thinking, why are these girls driving a van? And I remember some teammates thinking, oh, maybe, you know, it's just the van. You've got three girls. It's true. Young women right. in a van. What are you doing here? Yeah. And I'm like, but we don't get stopped when you're driving. Yeah. You know, my teammates at the time, both of them were blonde hair, blue eyes, like yeah. literally. Right. So I'm like, it's not just because we're three women driving a van. It's because they're saying, well, who's that black woman, black woman? driving yeah. this white van in the middle yeah. of Poland or, or, or Czech or Germany? Yeah. Like, who, why are you here? And they're just curious, but also just... Just the way that you you know you're, you're received by people. This happens across not just that's nothing to do with even the sport. Yeah. So you can imagine going to a sport where and there then, aren't many people, where drivers yeah. have been told black people like as in driving a bobsleigh, mm. black people aren't good drivers. They've yeah. been told that athletes have been told that. They've campaigned and pushed for kind of like you said diversity, and it's it is about just showing up. So us mm. being in the space is is doing something about it. So within bobsleigh itself and going into that environment, you know the sport itself has its challenges as well as just you being a person on the road driving a van. Right. There are black, you know, drivers and that drive the bobsleigh, they're called pilots, that, that were told numerous times that black, black people can't drive. They're not good drivers. And what that would do to someone who's actually got someone else's life in the back of their hands, in the back of that bobsleigh, yeah. um, and, you know, having amazing drivers in the world that were did amazing things, been to multiple Olympic games to have those that that mindset. It's mm-hmm. us being in the environment, us being in the space, black athletes, people from diverse backgrounds, being within the actual space of Bob Say or any sport that needs a bit more um, diversity in there, yeah. as we would say, um, is I think for me is the game changer because in order for you to, it's difficult to, like you said, achieve it if you can't see it. And not only just achieving it, but it's difficult to see us there mm-hmm. if you don't see us there. Yeah. Um, having like the first you know black swimmer you know steering is the same similar thing to saying oh well black people do swim because everyone thinks that you can't well, that's silly like actually my mom's great loved water from and i used to swim every week weekend yeah. when i was younger but it's having those misconceptions it's having those preconceptions as well and, and judgments of, of just whole communities of yeah. people that can't do this i won't do those things and and it's a similar thing with even sporting environments you know one of my most challenging um games I went to, not Olympic games, Commonwealth games, was actually in India, Delhi, and it's when I won my Commonwealth gold medal. Yeah. And it was such a challenging, one of my most challenging environments because of, not just because obviously the heat and just the environment, the culture, yeah. it's, you know, being in a space um, that we were as a team. And for example, we had like bugs, like, you know, mozzies or whatever. Yeah. Like, we said to in Jamaica, everyone had to spray the, the van. Yeah. There are challenges that as an athlete, Usually right. you don't have to deal with depending where you're going to. You have to deal with those the conditions, things in the yeah. environment. Mm-hmm. But you need people and saying that people can't put on the games and it was our most memorable and best games we had. We you know, we, right. we we set the history again and it hadn't been won for twenty five years, our British medals so when we won it. Won it there, um, under those conditions. But it also shows that different cultures and backgrounds can put on amazing shows that yeah. touch people for the rest of their lives, that has an impact on other people, not just athletes, volunteers, everyone that met, took yeah. part in that has an experience versus their lives. That is why I think we need the diversity because yeah. you have the diversity of thought as well within that. It's not yeah. just about seeing different types of, you know, people of colour. No, exactly, yeah, yeah. You need to, yeah. we, we think differently, that you're, the way you've brought up is differently. That you're, yeah. Everything then adds value to what you're trying to achieve. 100%, what yeah. is the point of having the same perspective at mm. all times? It's like being, having a board, for example, charity working with children that has no young people on a board. Well, why do you, if you're for young people, then there should be young people speaking yeah on behalf of, of those tasks, because how yeah. are you going to know what they want if you don't have anyone in the room that yeah. is speaking on behalf of those people? Because it's just not your experience if you're not. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know what I mean? It's not just... I get it. I mean, I, I, I get it. I mean, a, a lot of you, a lot of the things that you say, you know, uh, you know, some of it resonates with me, but also I, I have, um, you know, heard other people speak about it as well. So there's definitely a theme there, mm. right? And I do think that, you know, with 
with more diversity, actually there's more value. Um, having a single perspective or having a multiple perspective is better than having a single perspective, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, if you think about diversity, what does it, because people think about like, oh, what value are you talking about? It's really? it's cultural value. Yeah. It's the you know it's the thought that you talk about. It's a diversity of thought. It's not just for the sake of doing it, right? It's really the world perspective because world is not just one kind, right? It's yeah. a multiple kind, and having that multiple kind in one place and working on one thing, or in your case, bobsleigh or yeah. the sport, can elevate the whole sport altogether. Imagine having all sorts of diverse teams in yeah. bobsleigh and not just one kind, exactly. right? Suddenly you're making the sport so much more popular versus just, you know, exactly. a set of people doing it versus the whole world doing it. So that's the value I think yeah. of. It's that, you know, multiplication of impact. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you're doing one thing in one group, suddenly you bring a variety of group that can multiply your whatever you're trying to do right so that's brilliant if you think about like you know young person imagine imagine um a young black girl right um thinking about bobsleigh but they don't see diversity in sport as much as um they'll see in different sports maybe what would you say to that young black girl i would say to her what i would probably say to anyone that's thinking about something because it's the end of the day for me it's an opportunity for something um maybe an ch- opportunity to achieve something that you want to achieve in a different like arena because a lot of time we look at success as linear i would like x and stuff for me yeah. transferring into bob's day meant that i was back on a gb team i was now performing at, at a highest level again i was learning new things about myself i was developing as an athlete all the things that i love to do why i train right. so hard I got to do that again for a long time and then actually reset goals to achieve something greater than I actually even imagined. Right. So I would always say to them, the very thing that I would say to anyone, that like whatever goals that you have in life, there's not always one mm. way of doing it. Sometimes you just you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And you can be, it's very easy to be kind of trapped in the thought of, this is the, why, this is the only thing that I can do, this is what's gonna give me success. But I'd say, well, what if I, if I can give you exactly what you want? Right. But instead of it being wrapped up in blue paper, it's wrapped up in gold. Yeah. And that would, buy, and then they'd start thinking, oh, well, maybe I'll be able to do it. Yeah. If they were fearful about doing it, I'd say, I don't see much diversity in, in, in that sport. Mm. I'm thinking, I'm not really sure about it. I say that. I always say, well, you can always always try. Because mm-hmm. I always think, people ask, why do you do, have done for a very long time, multiple times they say why do you do what you do and i always responded with why not why not yeah because it's powerful me, that's the end of the conversation yeah. why not well, why yeah. not what else would you would want me to do right now right or what else would you prefer for because me you to go back to the you know I, feel, I hate to say this like people stereotype like oh but you you shouldn't do this because you're yeah. supposed to do that yeah um i've gotten that as well like i'm from india it's like oh are you an engineer it's like no no no. just because i work at google doesn't make <laughs> me an engineer and i'm from india no yeah. i i do advertising and then they get shocked because it's like never heard an indian person working advertising it's like there's a whole lot of people advertising in india there are people yeah. who work in advertising in india and they're indians right yeah. Um, so I've gotten this as well, and you know, obviously, I I I don't I don't let them stop me no. in whatever I want to pursue, and I I think that's a really good message for that you know young person that why not yeah. why not like you sh- if you're interested if you're passionate if you really want to try something just just go for it yeah. and then going back to your previous point you can always reverse that decision exactly. or change the direction or pivot to something else right and yeah. even if you don't want like so you don't know if you want to do it well you're only <laughs> going to find out if you try. Because the best way mm. to figure out what you like and what you don't like is doing all of it. Doing all of it. <laughs> doing yeah. everything and then going, oh, don't like that. It's like trying different food. You ever yeah. heard someone say, oh, don't eat, don't eat Brussels sprout? I say, have you tried them before? They're like, <laughs> no. I was like, well, how on earth yeah. do you know if you don't like it then? Because you made your decision up. You're and right. If you tried it, you're like, actually, it's not, not too bad. bad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to eat it ever again. <laughs> but that's your decision. But it's, I don't mind yeah. it. And the only way you can know is if you actually try it. It's so true. It's so true, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't. So I grew up in India and we did not have Brussels sprouts at all there yeah. because it's not a thing. No. And then I came here and then everybody's talking about Brussels sprouts and a lot of them are not 
liking it. And then I was like, hmm, let me try it. I don't like it, but I tried it. <laughs> yeah, tried it yeah. <laughs> I tried it. But yeah. at least you tried it. I tried know? it. Yes, yeah. I tried it. Um, there's a lot of mindset here uh, changing or really working with your mindset, right? Because if you have a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset, this is where the su- success comes from, right? What, do you have um, like tactics or some techniques that you apply um, or just talk, talk to us about like growth mindset versus a fixed mindset? Because, you know, again, going back to your point around you were in the abs with your, with your friend looking at each other. What are we doing here? Mm-hmm. But you were in for it because yeah. if you were fixed mindset, you'd be like, I'm going to give up. Like, this is not for us. We shouldn't be here because we are this and they're that, right? Yeah. But you had the growth mindset and you went for it and again and again. And then you, you, you know, won yeah. as well, right? So, uh, well, first, I'm sure everyone, I'm, I'm, well, maybe not sure everybody, but a lot of people know the difference between a, a fixed mindset of having that there's only one way, mm. that there's no, you can't, there's nothing interchangeable. Yeah. You can't change, your fate is your fate, essentially. It's like how it is is how it's going to be. Yeah. And I can't change that. If I had thought of that, then being in my environment from even young, mm. I would never be in this position yeah. ever. So the proof is in the pudding in the sense of that's actually not true, but it is a limiting belief. And a lot of people do have that. It's very strong and it's very common. When you have a, the growth mindset, and you're allowed to see outside of the box. So there is a sphere that you're in. That mm. That's your circle of, almost like your sphere of influence in yourself. If that's your circle and knowing that actually I'm the white person I am and my circumstances are changeable, right. I can do something about it. Mm-hmm. It then almost recreates power because I find a lot of the time, especially in my, in my community, a lot of the time is that young people, especially young people, because that's where it starts, don't understand that the power they have to change their lives because they don't see right. any control anywhere in their life. There's no control in terms yeah. of where they are. They're, they're, their family lineage of doing the things that they might aspire to be, they don't see it at all. Mm. So they don't really truly believe that that's a possible thing. Right. If you have the growth mindset and say, well, it doesn't mean that my upbringing or where I've been or my circumstances dictates then where I'm going to go forward. Right. They might be an indicator because they are for a lot of people where you, where you started off, a yeah. strong indicator. But it doesn't it doesn't mean that it's going to be the end result. Right. And knowing that, okay, if I just know that that's not true, first of all, that there is such a thing as a growth mindset, I can mm. change it. It b- brings back a little bit of that power. So now you start asking questions, well, what can I do? The age old, when we're younger, I wanted to buy something. Remember, every time your parents say, we can't afford it, we can't afford it, we can't afford it. Right. We can't afford it. Rather than saying, well, how can we afford it? Yeah. That is a very different sentence. It's... And it's very small, but if you do go, oh, I can't afford that. Okay, well, how can I? Mm. It then allows you to, creativity comes in straight away. Because you have to start thinking differently about problem solving. How am I going to change that? Being Going from the sprinting to bobsleigh mm. is still it's a huge growth mindset because right. it's looking at how, how on earth am I going to get from this position, yeah. very sucking around. I mean, doing sprinting for 15 years, you're very stuck in what you know, how you do it and how you deliver right. it. it you, you've done how many hours of that? It's a 10,000 yeah. hours of league practice. So many. So to reverse some of that stuff, because you do have to get out of habits that don't lend themselves to Solo to team, right? Yeah. Right. You have a team straight away. Yeah. So you're not on your own. <clears throat> now, for someone like me who's a control freak, that's not the best <laughs> environment for me. Like, it really right. isn't. Uh, it, 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 but it does challenge you in a positive way because you then develop a new skill. Yeah. Because you can only develop the skill once you actually are challenged with the skill itself. Exactly. People do not build resilience without adversity. There's no such thing. Yeah. Adversity comes, resilience comes from yeah. overcoming a barrier or a struggle and right. coming bouncing back faster than, better than ever. So if you don't have anything that's blocking your way, you cannot build resilience because yeah. there's no need to. Yeah. So I embrace the challenge of saying, I'm going to overcome something or push through something and I'm going to be in this now team environment when I really want to just do everything. Yeah. Actually, I'm not in control at all right. to help develop me into a better athlete to yeah. then t- pursue this goal that I want right. to do. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Resilience comes from diversity. I think that should be a quote everywhere. So powerful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, I mean, you have a, such positive energy. Thank you. Um, but we have to end it somewhere. Um, one of the questions I ask every guest at the end is, if you were young again, 1820, um, what would be the message to yourself? So, dear Montel, Gosh. finish that sentence. Gosh. Well, to me personally, to yeah. myself, if I said 
I would say to myself, honestly, at that age, I would say, dear Montel, start dreaming bigger than you could ever possibly imagine. Because right now where you are, being afraid of what you could be is the only thing holding you back. And once you get out of your own way, you can do great things. So powerful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. That's it.